Hello, YouTube! It's Dawn Prickett from TwiceYourCheap.com, and I know it's been a little while since we've uploaded a video, but I have a special treat for you today. I sat down the other day with the amazing Stephanie from RazzleDazzleRabbitry.com, and we had this really great discussion about what it means to be a fiber business in this day and age, what it, what it takes to be a small business in this day and age, and just kind of picking our, each other's brains on how to make this whole thing work and how it has worked for me in my business. So if you'd like a little bit of voyeurism and see how that went, here you go. I'll go ahead and introduce you. This is Dawn Prickett with us. And so um, for everyone on my channel, Dawn has her own YouTube channel and I just stumbled across it like a couple, it was only a couple months ago when I was, it was randomly in Christmas time and I'm searching for videos about yarny business and just different things on YouTube. And Dawn has an entire playlist on things that people interested in the business side of it could look at. And not only that, but I realized Dawn absolutely, well, from your videos, she absolutely knows what she's doing. So in the area of business, and uh, there's a ton of videos as well about knitting and different knitting techniques and things that are important. in knitting. there's just a whole variety of things. And I was immediately like, yes, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> so for all my viewers watching this video, definitely go check Dawn out at Twice Sheared Sheep, but it's Dawn Prickett at YouTube. So there's two different things in that. And Dawn can obviously share with you how to find her on social and if you haven't already. And um, I love your story, by the way. That's one of the things that when you do your videos and you tell the story of the unraveling of the sweaters that you found and that, can you just tell it? Is that okay? Can you just tell this? Yeah, story? yeah. Awesome. So um, I know that everybody comes to the fiber arts from different spaces um, that I actually, I learned to knit at as a young adult at 18 or whatever, an ex-boyfriend's mom taught me to knit. I learned to crochet when I was like 12, um, but I didn't pick it up again until I was married and had young children. And actually it was a way to, um, I had been really, really big into MMO role-playing games. And I spent way too much time on the computer and realized it was not good for my psyche, for myself, for my family. I think I have an addictive personality. <laughs> and so I took up knitting again. I had um, two little kids. Um, my, my teenage daughter who is 16, who actually, no, she just turned 17, was a baby at the time. And um, I was a stay-at-home mom. And obviously I didn't have a lot of money. Um, my husband um, was working, but as a stay-at-home mom of two little kids, I, I didn't have a lot of money for yarn, and the, the only yarn that I'd ever knit with was from a big box store, from Michael's or from Hobby Lobby or something like that. I'd only actually knit with acrylic until I got into these Yahoo groups, which was, you know, pre-Ravelry, pre-YouTube, pre-any of this, and um, everybody was crazy about sock yarn and it was wool. And I'm like, isn't wool itchy? Why are you wanting to knit with wool? This, you know, it was baffling to me. And it was right about the time that Socks That Rock was first came out, that the hand dyed yarn movement began. And I had made a comment and they're like, oh, but our wool is so soft, you'll never believe it. And they sent me a skein of yarn in the mail. Like free, just, legit, I, I will always love this company because of this. And they sent me this skein of sock yarn and it was the most gorgeous, wonderful thing I had ever, I'd ever knit with. And from that point, I never wanted to go back to acrylic from the craft store, but I couldn't afford to buy lots of wonderful wool yarn. And so I was perusing the internet one time and I found a blog post about how to unravel sweaters um for for thrift store or thrift store sweaters for the yarn and I thought well that's great I can get wool yarn and even though they don't have it at Hobby Lobby or, you know things like this and so I went to the thrift store and I bought like four or five sweaters I think I bought a cotton sweater and I bought one that was like a rayon blend it looked like it looked like silk it was shiny and it was gorgeous and I bought a couple of wool sweaters didn't know anything, you know, other than this one 
YouTube or it wasn't even YouTube. It was a blog post on yeah. how to unravel sweaters. <laughs> and, and so I, I unraveled my first one, which, you know, you, you snip a little piece of the seam and you unzip it or, but I didn't do it right. I don't think. And I didn't have a swift or a skein winder. So I had a baby gate because obviously two little children I had a baby gate and I set the the crank at exactly like um it, it ended up being a yard so like three feet or something like that and with my arm you know wrapping around the outside of the baby gate to get the the hank <laughs> my shoulder was sore it was a massive undertaking and then I had this big fat skein I mean just this big around you know from the from the sweater winding all into one one hank and I thought, okay, great. I've got yarn now. So I went to my bathroom and I put it in the sink with, I didn't even have wool wash. So she had a shampoo, <laughs> put it in the sink with hair shampoo and you had to rinse it because it was hair shampoo. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> and went to squeeze out the water, um, sort of as best as I could. Uh -huh. And then took just a clothes hanger and hung it on the towel rack. And 24 hours later, it's still dripping on the floor in the bathroom because obviously I didn't get enough water out of it. And oh, obviously goodness. it was too big and my shoulder okay. hurt and it took forever. And there was dust flying in the air when I was unraveling. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And of course the first <laughs> one that I did was the rayon yarn that looked like silk. Uh -huh. And instead of being one thick ply, it was multiple little strands. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is stupid. I'm never doing this again. Oh, <laughs> but, about a, but about a week later, I was looking at that pile of sweaters over there and I'm like, well, I think I know a little bit better what to do. And so, you know, I picked up another sweater and I was better about it the second time and then the third time. And that eventually I had unraveled so many sweaters that it was more yarn than I personally could knit. And so I saw that there were people who were selling this on eBay and I thought, well, I, I could sell yarn on eBay. And so I listed a whole sweaters lot worth of yarn on eBay and it sold. And that was like the very first, my very first bug of, oh crap, I could have a business. This is amazing. And, you know, even though I hated unraveling that first sweater, I have unraveled thousands of sweaters oh by God. this point. <laughs> and I, I found myself, you know, you're walk, you're standing behind somebody at the, at the checkout and they're wearing this gorgeous sweater and I'm like picking apart the seams mentally. <laughs> how is this constructed? <laughs> and, you know, we started on eBay, um, selling whole sweater lots worth, um, auction wise and people would bid it way up or people would buy it just flat or, and then to, um, kind of standardize things. And we moved over to Etsy when Etsy became a thing. And then in 2016, we built our own website and we had our own website. And eventually, you know, the way that all fiber arts goes is like a rabbit hole that you start with one thing and you're like, oh, I think I'll unravel a sweater, you know, I want some wool yarn. <laughs> and then pretty soon you've got, you learn how to spin and you've got a spinning wheel. And pretty soon you've got like 500 knitting needles. And pretty soon you learn how to make stitch markers. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And it all just kind of follows. And I think that business is that same way that it becomes kind of a rabbit hole and you learn, you learn how to first how to make the thing, then you learn how to take pretty pictures, then you learn how to build a website, then you learn how to run ads and pretty soon you're like, I'm building an empire over yes. here. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I love that story. And it makes me laugh because just I think it fits so many other yarnies, so many fiber artists out there, so many people. We get started on something and it's that one thing and then we're gone. And, and that's, it's this, it's this beautiful, beautiful thing. And you were able to um, build and build in your skills. So you're, you're describing the building of the skills and the building of the skills and, and it's through the course of time. And that's something, I don't know if yeah. you find this, but um, sometimes I find impatience pops up or wanting something to, wanting to be someplace perhaps that maybe our skills are not there yet, 
or the t we haven't put the time in or the learning in or the practice in. But eventually when we do, we, we build and we keep growing and our businesses keep growing. So um, when I, again, I when think I, it's, I think it's, well, per, you can, yep. I, I was gonna say, I, yeah, I think it's super easy to compare your beginning to somebody else's middle or somebody else's end. Yes. You know, because you're starting out and particularly since we are artists at heart, you know, you have this grand vision and you you know where you want to be and you have this idea and all these these things and you can see it so clearly, but you're not quite sure how to get there yet. And um, I think that that in, in any form of art form, you know, in when I started watercolor, it was really easy to look at everybody else's paintings and be like, well, mine looks like a two year old did this, <laughs> you know, and or when you first start out knitting or, you know, or you spin your first yarn and you're like, well, that was a complete waste of fiber. <laughs> because, <laughs> oh, but man. everything is that way that it it just takes some repetitions and you want to know everything right at the start, but sometimes you don't know until you've done something. When you take that leap of faith and you start doing it, like you you launch your first product and you learn things along the way and people will tell you things and it doesn't make any sense until you have <laughs> done it yourself and you're like, that's what that meant. <laughs> so yeah. You have spoken in some of your videos, um, you had a, a program or a coach who, Renee, I believe, and um, yes, who I've watched some of her videos because obviously I watched your video and I was like, oh, I got to check this out now. <laughs> well, so um, can, would you mind sharing a little bit about how, uh, how having her in your life and how that process helped you and where you are now? So I think that particularly as fiber artists or as artists in general, um, we have a tendency to, to say, you know what, I can do everything myself because you look at the world like, I can make that, you know, I could go buy supplies at Hobby Lobby, I could make that. And so it's really easy to look at business the same way and to say, well, I can, I can reverse engineer what they did there, you know, um, that I... I joined Renee Christine's program. It's called Handmade Titan University. Um, back then it was called Rich Mom Business. Um, I joined it in 2016. And it was the first time I had ever spent money on business training for myself. And um, I, the, the class is rather expensive for a beginning you know, person. I think it was $1,000 at the time on a payment plan. You know, And I remember talking to my husband and being panicky and being like, can I actually invest this kind of money? And is it gonna do anything for me? And the program it was phenomenal and was perfect for exactly where I was at because it teaches you how to properly brand a business. Um, that I, I don't know if I have any of my old branding still on, on the YouTube channel, but you know, my logo right now is a purple heart or a purple circle and it has TSS with you know a heart in it. Um, back in the day, it was a um, it was a sheep with a sweater and, you know, the sweater is being unraveled into a ball of yarn and it was just a little hand drawn sheep. And before that, it was a sheep that I had done in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> you can picture this in like squares and circles. <laughs> and, uh, but it teaches how to properly brand your business. It teaches how to create a collection of cohesive things and launch it together. It teaches you how to build an email list and how to um, consistently capture that and how to market to that email list every single week. And that has been absolutely key to how I built my business. But after I had followed Renee for a couple of years that you start to build a little bit of confidence in your ability that, you know, the idea of, oh, if I, if I follow a training and I learn it, then I, my business grows and I make more money and I have since gathered several other coaches that I follow and adore and love. And um, I, I, I really think that when you take that leap, 
to begin to follow a coach, to be to begin to follow somebody who's been where you're at, um, that it makes such a huge difference. It's really easy to, you know, like I said, it's really easy to say, oh, I can reverse engineer everything. I can YouTube everything. Yes. But what you get from a paid program is so much more than what you can get from YouTube, even as generous as Renee is, or as I try to be in, and as honest as I try to be in sharing what I do and in my journey and all of the, you can learn how to knit anything on YouTube. Um, that, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So you, so it was the, you had the initial jump and yet there's a lot of anxiety, but through following and actually learning the process and, and going through, it got to the point where you were able to further jump and to, to further grow, to further, and there was, yeah. it doesn't sound like a lot of stagnation in there. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a lot <laughs> of time was spent um, uh, down, not a lot of downtime. Well, it, it sounds that way, but it doesn't necessarily feel that way at the time. So, you know, I started following Renee Christine in 2016 and I learned how to do everything properly. And then she offered her architect course, Ultimate Architect, which is her website building course. And so I took that in the fall of 2016 and built my website. But, you know, it's just kind of out there and in the ether. And I'm like, well, my email list knows to come here, but her program doesn't talk a lot about um, how to get new people into your world. Yes. Um, how to, you know, so it talks about branding and about marketing to your audience and, and all of these things. But the problem then became of how do I get new people in? And the internet is full of people who are like, you know, oh, you can take a Pinterest course, you can take a social media course, you can take an Instagram course, you can take a YouTube course. I took my next coach that I followed, her name is Courtney Foster Donahue. And I took a class on Facebook, on Facebook ads and in general. And every Facebook ad course that I've ever seen out there is geared mostly towards content creators. Um, Courtney then went on to her main course right now. I don't even think she offers her Facebook course anymore. Um, her main course is on building a course and teaching other people how to build a course. And it's called the course course. <laughs> and, um, but I, I found it frustrating that, you know, even her Facebook course was geared towards um, people who are teaching online or content yeah. creators or bloggers or things like this. There isn't a lot of content for maker businesses yeah. like us, for yeah. fiber artists or artists in general or product businesses, yeah. because we have to do things differently. And so after I took her Facebook class, you know, I learned how to adapt that to my product business. And she then introduced me to um, Todd Herman, who is a, he's a mindset coach and he works with pro athletes and with um, giant businesses. And here I am this little tiny fiber product business in this class with, with this big coach and all of the other businesses are like, I'm a coach. I'm a high pirate CEO. My company makes, you know, $500,000 or $5 million. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I like, yeah, that, I like, I like yeah that, that honestly, you know, I have my, I have a YouTube video that says, you know, how I, how I made $300,000 in my business. But if you watch the video, it took me years to cumulatively make $300,000. Yes. Last year was the first year that I actually broke a hundred thousand dollars in a single year, which, which has been awesome. a goal for a very long time. That's absolutely awesome. <laughs> but you know, and not only did we do a hundred thousand dollars last year, we did over two hundred thousand dollars last year. Wow. And wow. these are the differences that as you start to build your skills and you start to begin to see that there are possibilities that you didn't even know existed. And that's something I think that a really good coach is good is because they can help you see, you know what? What, what on earth is stopping you from being able to, do, to yeah. turn your little fiber business into something amazing? I love when you live in this- Yes, that, that what is stopping yeah. 
because I think there's a lot of people who, who watch uh, my channel, who watch the Razzle Dazzle Rabbit Between Yarns channel, who want, they are a lot of, a lot of people are moms. A lot of people want to have their own fiber arts business. And whether it's, uh, obviously I, I do a lot with Angora rabbits and hand spinning yarn <laughs> and um, knitting and crocheting, but there's a lot of people who there's, um, you know, obviously there's so much going on in the world and there's a, a need, there's always a need for what's genuine. There's always a need to connect. There's always a need for what's authentic and real and to, to have meaning and to have purpose. And so many people, especially I think uh, if they are, have been um, perhaps in isolation due to situations of COVID, <laughs> like it, it puts this time to reflect. And there's a lot of, a lot of people who, who want um, more and that idea of I could have a, a little yarny business. I like that. But then what I like more is, well, why can't I have more than just a little business or a little yarny business? Because so often when we think of yarn, I, um, I don't often hear a lot of people say, well, this is a six figure yarny business, or this is a six figure maker business. There's really, um, yeah. a, there's a, what, what, what might the right word be? A, a lack of communication. There's a lack of, um, there's a lack of videos out there. There's a lack geared towards um, a bigger dream instead of just making enough to pay for your yarn or making enough to pay for your hobby, making enough just to pay for your, your rabbits, whatever it is. So um, not many people, which is why I was drawn to you, is that you say, you know, you had the, the, uh, the intellect to say, let's do a program. Let's have a coach. Let's seek out more than just what's inside. Well, and I, I heard it said once that you, your business cannot grow faster than you do personally. And I think that that is so very, very true because we all start out where we're at you know, you're learning new things, you have different wants, you have different needs, and that's okay. You know, the whole point of having a business, you know, first of all, is that you can help support your family, which I am huge, huge on. I mean, I, I am, I have been a stay at home mother of five children through their whole lives. And this has been because I have a business, a huge proponent of it. Everybody should have a business. I think it's, <laughs> wonderful but also that you you don't want that business to to create a life that you hate you yeah. want that business to create a life that you love and i think so many um so many artists you, you get pushed to you know you create something beautiful and then to monetize that and then you follow somebody's plan and that creates a world where you're like, why am I living in this world? You know, I've just created the worst job possible for myself. Yes. But at the same time, everybody talks about $100,000 is like the ceiling, is like, this is the goal that, you know, just, and nobody ever talks about anything that is beyond that. Yes. And I think that that's a disservice to maker businesses because we can absolutely have all of that. You know, the idea that we, we think about, we think about ourselves as such small little potatoes, but yeah. everything started out as small little potatoes. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Idaho. I'm cur I currently live in Idaho. <laughs> and I, I made that comment before. I always feel like I'm such small potatoes. And they looked at me, they're like, we're going to make you a great big Idaho potato. <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to turn my phone off. I'm sorry. Excuse me. One moment. My alarm's going off. I have it set so that I have to pick up the kids from school because I run around with the kids. But obviously today's Saturday. It's Saturday. <laughs> I never adjusted that. You know, let's just go and pick up the kids. <laughs> but anyways, yes, yes, we'll just do it every day. <laughs> right. So the the ability to look at the situation and and to say more than just the ceiling, more than just this number, more than just that, and. And um, like I said, I think that's rare. And I don't hear a lot of that. For example, um, 
last year there, I didn't attend any craft fairs or fiber festivals or anything due to COVID, but um, it was the year before that I had, I was attending quite a bit and there was a lot of struggle and I hear a lot of struggle from vendors. And um, it was at, it was an alpaca, an alpaca show and a lot of people um, with their businesses, you know, it was almost like there was that self, uh, that limit placed on by who other than just the person. And so, yeah, it's, um, I think it's very important to talk, to discuss that. So see, and that, and that absolutely breaks my heart, you know, that, and I know that some of it is, you know, particularly we all come at things from diff with different skill sets and different, um, different knowledge bases. Um, I've met a lot of fiber people who really understand how to take care of the animals and how good husbandry and how to manage a farm and all of that. But the idea of taking that into the online space is like taking it to another planet. Yes. Or, you know, the idea of raising sheep and you sell your, your sheep to the mill or to the, you know, to all of these things. And it kind of breaks my heart because I would love to see a farmer who can raise gorgeous fleeces, you know, and have an email list of people who are following all along, know all of their, their alpacas names and are lined up to be able to buy those fleeces on shearing day. And they're all sold and they're all accounted for to individual people who are gonna cherish that. Yeah. And I think that that's what the internet gives us, but not everybody, can can see that or understand how to get from here to here right yeah <laughs> yeah it, exactly. so when i'm watching your videos that's one of the biggest there's so many things but but that's one of the things that you know it really jumps out and it really strikes me and that's different about about your videos that you know nobody else puts that out there which is why it's like i want i want people to check out your channel i want i want my viewers oh. to go look at these videos go go see um, but the products that you offer now, so you have digital patterns, right? You, um, mm -hmm. can you tell me about your products and can, is, do, would you be able to talk about just how you went from the unraveling of the sweaters to now, to what you offer now? So again, it's kind of an evolutionary process, um, that I, I have serial obsessions and I like to try new things. But I realized, you know, in business that um, contrary to my artist heart, I'll, you have to pay attention to what your customers actually want and not necessarily all the beautiful things that you want to make. Um, that, so I do sell digital patterns. Um, I'm not, I, I wouldn't consider myself a major, you know, a, a product or a, a pattern designer because I don't sell a lot of patterns. I don't actually market a lot of patterns. Um, and because I like to make patterns for the things that I like to make, and that's not necessarily the things that people like to buy. <laughs> um, I had a product collection um, a couple summers ago. It was called the, the Candyland Collection. And I, I designed a knitted game, game board. It's a blanket and it's like Candyland. And I, I loved every minute of designing it. I, it was an intellectual just puzzle of how, how can I piece these things together and how can I make this happen? And I had these cute little play pieces and everything. And I loved designing that. I knew that my audience would not necessarily buy it just because I know my audience so well. And it's true that, you know, I've, I've sold maybe a couple of copies of that, of that pattern, but I loved designing it. And but as a business, I need to be able to sell the things that I know that people are going to buy and that they're going to enjoy, and as well as the things that I feel good making. And so we transitioned from doing recycled yarn, which I do love recycled yarn, but there was always this feeling of, I love the idea that it's good for the environment. I love the idea that I'm rescuing the fiber. I love all of that. But the, the yarn itself was never really my favorite to knit with. And it was, I, I felt almost disingenuous saying, you know, oh, this is the best yarn on the planet because it's not really. 
it was designed, you know, when it was created, it was designed to be handled by knitting machines. And so the yarn is very flat. It's not as round, which is what hand knitters like, what I like. Um, and I also found that the more volume that I was doing, the more that I was selling, I, I, I one physically could not keep up with it, but I also couldn't reliably reproduce the same thing. Um, that when you unravel a sweater, you only have so much yarn. And once that dye lot sells out, you don't have any more of it, even if there was demand for it. And it was very frustrating as a business because I would design a beautiful pattern to go with this yarn and it would sell out immediately. And then I couldn't offer it again. And I think that that's a disservice to me as a business. And it's a disservice to all of my fans and all of my customers because I couldn't keep giving them the things that they wanted. And so we, we did discontinue our yarn, our recycled yarns. And we have shifted everything over to our knitting tools, which are our row counters. Yes, let's see like that. this. Yes. Um, so our row counters, which is a chain of loops with numbers on it to, it's like a fancy stitch marker. So you put it on your needles and, um, and as you're knitting along, when you come back to it, you just go to the next number of the chain and it keeps track of all of your rows, as opposed to the little clicker thing that you have to remember to click it or the little hashtags on the, on the piece of paper to remember, did I mark that? Did I not mark that? If I do it in pen and I have to rip out your, rip out rows, am I gonna know where I was at? And, or highlighting your lace chart and you're like, oh crap, I had to rip out five rows and now they're all highlighted. <laughs> and, um, and then we sell stitch markers, which are our own personal designs. Those are beautiful. And they are our mainstays of our business. And we've offered different things and tried out different things. But the biggest thing is that it has to be something that I can reproduce reliably and regularly so that we can scale. Yeah. Not only so that we can serve more customers so that they can have pretty things, but also so that the business can scale. Yeah. Um, and it has to be something that I can teach somebody else how to make. We currently have five assistants oh, in our wow. shop. Um, and I realized this last year, I, I had I'd honestly avoided hiring assistants for years and years and years. I tried lots of different avenues of how can I make this business bigger without hiring anybody because I have no desire to be a boss. I have no desire. But then um, I realized once I hired an assistant that my capacity expanded so much more. The vision of what we could become expanded so much more. And this past fall, I realized when I hired another assistant, I think she was number four, that almost every single one of the women that I had hired had told me that they had been praying for an opportunity like this. And the idea that my business can not only serve my customers, but that it can be the means to be an answer to somebody else's prayer yes. was huge for me. The idea that this business not only supports my family, but it can help support other people's families was huge for me. And so when I continue to grow, that is what I think about is if I can make some, if I can continue to grow this business, not only can I serve the knitting community and make beautiful things that make their lives better, but that I can make my employees' lives better. I can make other stay-at-home moms. I can have an opportunity for them to work at home with their babies because not everybody wants to start a business. I realized this, this as an entrepreneur, it kind of blew my mind. I'm like, wait, you, you don't want to start a business? What? <laughs> and, but the idea that this thing that we're creating, you know, can then help other people and help them feed their families is huge. And that's part of the reason why I have my YouTube channel is because I want to, I want to see people be able to feed their families. I want people to be able to see and create their, their beautiful vision out in the world. I want you to be able to, you know, sell your fiber and see people use it and all of that. That's, that's what we're, that's what we're after here. Right. It's more, right. It's more than it's just more. Yeah. yeah. I think, but I didn't start out. I didn't start out there. You know, you talked about 
that if you had if you had asked me two years ago, I'm like, I have no vision for this business. What is this vision thing that everybody always talks about? The vision of this is that we eat next week. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that's going to be enough, right? <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Yes. That, that's, we, we grow into these things. It's okay if your vision is we eat next week. Yes, eating is good. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay <laughs> I had a question and now I just lost it with eating <laughs> but anyways um any topics that we haven't covered in this in this bit of time I think I don't know when we started to be honest with you I was I didn't properly look at a clock but um oh I wasn't looking okay but anything that we haven't talked about that you want to put out there that you want to talk about topics um anything like that that you kind of had a burning urge hey, tell me about the vision tell me about the vision that you have for your business oh right right tell me about your tell me about your bunnies tell me about your vision right okay so i'll try to be brief but i have this um i have this terrible habit of uh very much digressing and getting off topic so it's just kind of the way my brain thinks i get distracted very easily so um much like your story, I started out a long time ago, and it was my grandma actually who started, uh, who taught me to knit. And then I had, I forgot because I stopped using it. I stopped doing it. And I started out with acrylic yarn because that's what she had. That's what's around me. That's what was around me. And for the most part, that's still what is uh, around primarily besides the internet. And so um, we, uh, life happened, life moves on. And in graduate school, I picked up knitting needles again because I needed to see progress. I needed to see some physical progress. I wanted to do something, I needed something. And then of course, um, you know, there's multiple times just kept picking, kept picking up the needles, but it was always really acrylic yarn that, that I was using. And as I got older, um, I was, I was a therapist and I, uh, I wanted, I, I had a baby, I had a child, I wanted one, I wanted soft yarn. I wanted very soft, good yarn. I didn't want, um, I didn't want plastic yarn. And all the, even the most, you know, the softest acrylics, they, they weren't real. And it, I had no story. There was nothing to my yarn. It was simply what I was at a box store. It had no meaning, it had no purpose. And of course, so, um, I had rabbits since I was in third grade and, and never an Angora rabbit. And I decided I'm gonna start out, we're gonna get rabbits. And then of course, we're gonna learn how to shear them. Then we're gonna learn how to spin. And, and it just goes from there. And so this leads me to, um, this leads me to being in a position at work where it is, um, uh, yeah, I was in community mental health basically. So you work with all sorts of different types of people. You see all sorts of different sorts of things. And, you know, um, really wanting to be there for my child. And then eventually um, I had two children. And now I have with, I have two stepchildren as well. So I have four children total, but um, really wanting more out of life and wanting purpose out of life. And so, it starts with wanting better yarn and it grows into this vision of, but there's so many other people who want this as well. There's so many other people who also want good yarn, but they want a life where they themselves too can feel purpose, can feel meaning. They, they can have a business that's theirs. And so what I would love to see is I would love to be able to help create the path and to write it out and to say, listen, here are some steps, here are some things, these are the things and this is what I did to get to where I am. And so um, I would love to see people finding what matters to them in the fiber arts and doing it, and especially with Angora rabbits, <laughs> especially. <laughs> so long story, long story short, really just um, more uh, using fiber arts, you know, to have a more authentic life. So that's all, you know, nothing. Nothing, uh, nothing small, really. <laughs> it's just a little big. I think, I think it's, I think it's huge. The idea that you want to creating a life that is real, out of real things, and yes, yes. I love that. That resonates so yes. much. Absolutely, um, 
especially yeah absolutely you know and i um i think you know a lot of the a lot of the videos or podcasts that have been on my channel recently um a lot of the members only videos we discuss there's a lot happening in the in the rabbit world for example there's it's like a broken rabbit world where um we used to be able to communicate with each other and we used to be able to oh now i pressed the screen and lost you now let's see if i can there we go we as as rabbit raisers as humans with rabbits we used to be able to communicate civilly with each other and we are in a difficult strange spot right now in, in the rabbit world where there's a lot of difficulty because um everyone is is like combative you know and especially on social media and people are really struggling um to find answers and to find truth and so if they have a question about raising rabbits for example they are people are struggling to post the question and not become attacked or to to have answers that are helpful which is truly what's happening in many places on social media but um, that's one thing which we've been, you know, just discussing is can let's get back to an unbroken rabbit community. Let's get back to a, a place where we we can talk together and we're not um, we're not yelling at each other or we're not you know we're not arguing on social media or or whatever it is where where it becomes a much more supportive place. Um, which is, like I said, that's another kind of a, another rabbit hole that that I went down recently. But oh. I, I think that the whole the whole world has kind of become that way. That you know the idea of how divided everything is, and I think everybody feels the stress yes. of being cooped up during COVID, and and it comes out in irritability yes. online, and that kind of breaks my heart that that's, you know, in the rabbit community and we saw it with Ravelry and, you know, in the knitting community. And I'm like, fiber people are some of legitimately the kindest, most wonderful yeah. human beings on the planet. Yeah. I'm like, if you're willing to spend hours making something for another person, you, you know, everything about your personality usually means that you are such a kind, wonderful human. And it says something about our world at large that, that even those people who are so wonderful and so kind and so generous are feeling the stress to where that's coming out as attacking each other in rabbit groups. <laughs> right, right, like fluffy rabbit groups. <laughs> but you're, you have a good point it's Like, too. come on, go pet your rabbit. <laughs> exactly, it'll be just fine, I promise. But yes, oh my goodness. Yeah, it, you know, and we think about it and it's like, um, and that's kind of that's in that's the world our, our businesses exist in and we exist in this world and and we have to navigate it and we're not alone you know there's others out there <laughs> thank you for bringing more joy into that world and trying to bring <laughs> more love back into <laughs> thanks, thanks, I try. because that honest honestly that's what the what what we need is is more people like you bringing joy and love and everything back to the fiber. I, I hope so. And reminding everybody. Yeah. It, right now it kind of feels intolerable. Like I'm just like, I don't even want to turn on social media, but I got to upload a video. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> but anyways, yes. So um, I don't know. That's, that's what I've got for now. You know, just, I don't know. Maybe we can solve the world's problems sometimes here. Like, I, I don't really know, but <laughs> solve, solve some yarny communication problems or rabbit problems, or we'll just talk about business. That's probably a bit easier. <laughs> so I think, I, I honestly think that, you know what, as you, as you talk about some of these things and you spread positivity out, it is going to filter out to the rest of the world. You're going to solve the world's problems oh, that's a, yeah. through fluffy rabbits. Let's, through fluffy rabbits. Let's do it. If everybody does it in their own sphere, the world is just better. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. So tell tell us where can we find you? Where speaking of social, where can we positively find you on social? <laughs> okay, so you can find um my my main business twice your cheap at twiceyourcheap.com. 
Um, we have a Facebook Facebook page, Twice Your Cheap. We do not have a group because, again, trying to maintain my my life. But we do have a knit club that we meet twice a week on Zoom, either Mondays or Wednesdays, whichever works great for you. That if you join our our email list, our knit club, that there's a link there every that you could come knit with me, awesome. and we have a great time. Um, and for my business trainings is over on my personal website, which is dawnprickett.com. And we have a beginner's very basic um, Facebook ads course that's up right now. And our larger, more in-depth Facebook ads course is currently closed, but it should be opening soon. So awesome. And those, the Facebook trainings are actually your trainings, right? They are, they are my trainings and they are specifically geared towards product-based businesses. Um, because like I said, when I was looking for Facebook ads training for other, for all of my friends, for my fiber arts friends, you know, I'd send them to this guru or this guru or this guru, and they'd come back and they're like, Don, it, it doesn't work for me. They're not talking about products. They're talking about, you know, they're talking about selling their course or they're talking about their blog or they're talking about this information products and lead magnets. And I'm like, what is a, and they're like, what is a lead magnet? And I'm like, oh, honey, <laughs> we're product-based business. You need to sell a product. Yeah. It, you, and so the training is specifically geared towards product-based businesses and, and towards maker businesses, because I want to, I never intended to be a coach legitimately. <laughs> uh, I just want to run my business and do, I always just wanted to run my business and do my thing. But um, like I said, it breaks my heart to see so many fiber businesses and so many maker businesses kind of on the constant treadmill of social media posting and then not getting any traction Absolutely. or to be on Etsy and to say, you know, you only get the sales that Etsy decides to drop in your lap. And you know, we know that we need more than what somebody else chooses to give us. We want to have control over what we can do. And the best method that I have found to grow my business personally was through Facebook ads. And so that's what I decided to make a little course on. So that awesome. hopefully, hopefully other businesses will then be able to grow and support their families and eat. <laughs> For eat. Yes, that's absolutely awesome. So again, um, are you, so you have your YouTube channel as well. So I definitely recommend everyone. You do, yes. Yeah. Which is, um, Don Prickett is the YouTube handle. And I haven't uploaded anything recently because I've been working on the big Facebook course, but soon. Good. <laughs> Awesome. Very good. Well, thank you so much for, for sitting down with me and for chatting. And I hope everyone goes and checks out your course. I know that that's what I'm going to be doing. We're going to, like, I always love stuff like that. I love learning. I love finding out things that can help grow a business, especially when it is specifically geared towards a maker business. That's absolutely invaluable. So cool. Well, if you don't thank have you, Stephanie. Yes, you're, you're welcome. And hopefully- It was so nice to meet you. <laughs> you as well, you as well. All right, well, thank you so much, Don, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Hey, bye, Stephanie.